The late 1940s and 1950s were the autumn of the Victorian age. By the end of the decade, Macmillan, the last Victorian-born Prime Minister, could declare, you have never had it so good. People had rebuilt their communities at great speed, fuelled by a common purpose inherited from the war. The empire was evolving into a commonwealth with a young queen at its heart. With war in abeyance, material progress was embraced steadily by those whose expectations had been straightened by depression and war. It was a long way from the early industrial wasteland of a hundred years earlier. But things were still made, and faith remained in big universal ideas. A welfare state, social housing, education for all, and fundamental human rights. Being the autumn of the Victorian age, attempts were made to restore public morality, which once more exposed hypocrisy, and life was still cheap. On the other hand, 30 years of war and depression had flattened the inequality in wealth a little. The urchin wraith was smiling. On his return from Nuremberg, Maxwell Fife pursued these themes in papers and speeches. There is in each of us a sundial factor of our mentality. We are inclined only to count the sunny hours. Moreover, after exhausting wars, men tend to suffer a weariness of mind. This lassitude can make them shrink away from facing the limitations of human nature. It can produce a facile scepticism about their evil deeds. New generations dislike reading the history of the gas chambers, and so the fact that men claiming to be civilised put millions to death in the gas chambers slips from history. Most people approach the subject of war crimes trials fundamentally either as a cynic or an idealist. This is, I think, because in essence the case for or against trying war criminals depends on that controversial subject which has become succinctly known as human rights. Your cynic says, human rights, there are none. Your idealist, however, takes the view that there are certain rights and freedoms, not created by lawyers, but to which mankind as such are heir and which cannot be alienated. It is a conception akin to the idea of the law of nature, which has had such a wide influence on relationships in past centuries, although now somewhat outmoded, the idea of fundamental human rights is one in which I firmly believe. unfortunate generation has proved one thing, it is demonstrated that the barbarian is not behind us, but always underneath us, ready to rise up. Oh, 
sooner than he might have expected, Maxwell Fife was given the chance to put these ideas into practice. There are waters, there are waters blown. One day in 1947, Winston called me across the smoking room of the House of Commons and asked me if I would join the Committee of the United Europe Movement, of which he was chairman. I had always been anxious to do something positive after the part I had played in destroying the Nazi ideology, and I accepted with enthusiasm. I wanted to do something about human rights. There are waters blown by changing winds. Our draft had at its basis security for life and limb, freedom from arbitrary arrest, freedom from slavery and compulsory labour, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom of marriage, the sanctity of the family, equality before the law, and freedom from arbitrary deprivation of property. I was very anxious that we should get an international sanction in Europe behind the maintenance of these basic decencies of life. Between the Congress at The Hague and the first meeting of the Assembly of the Council of Europe at Strasbourg, I devoted a considerable further study to a European Convention on Human Rights. At home, I had the invaluable aid of Professor Lauterpacht of Cambridge, about whom I later wrote that our lunatic century is looking for a way of guaranteeing ordinary people a quiet life. And there is, in my opinion, no more noble subject to which one of our leading jurist consults could devote his pen. There was, of course, resistance to the ideas. 
Human rights in the Council of Europe has, of course, started all wrong as a result of the non-governmental committee which drew up their wonderful plan for the European Court of Human Rights and the extraordinary influence of what is called in the previous minute the Council of Europe mystique. The then Lord Chancellor, William Jowett, could not conceive of the Convention or the Court. Of course, I realise that for political reasons we must, in some form or other, accept this draft convention. At the same time, I feel bound to state that from the point of view of the administration of the law, I regard this necessity as an unqualified misfortune. Our unhappy legal experts, two distinguished Home Office officials, who would have expressed their complete inability to draft a bill, for example, to prevent the docking and nicking of horses, have had to do their best to draw up a code compared to which the Code Napoleon, or indeed the Ten Commandments, are comparatively insignificant. The Foreign Office sighed and suggested, I wish some method could be devised. It really would be a most fruitful thing by which the Lord Chancellor and Sir David Maxwell Fife, who deals with things in the Assembly, could be brought together to argue things out. I was elected Chairman of the Legal and Administrative Committee of the Council of Europe, to which the question of human rights was referred. I made a speech in the main meeting in which I asked my colleagues to accept a system of collective security against tyranny and oppression. It was I said, a simple and safe insurance policy. Darling Mo, we are thinking of you and hope you are having a beautiful time. Pam and I have had a lovely day here and go on to Daddy this evening. Love and kisses from Mummy. The Committee of Ministers have left out human rights, so we must try to get the Assembly to put it back. If the Council of Foreign Ministers do not take it, after the Assembly has approved it, as I believe it will, we are going to have a magnificent row about the rights of the Assembly as well as the rights of man. I can't think what made the Ministers reject it. Mo, this is the place in which we meet and hold the Parliament of Europe. The room has the most fascinating tapestries. All the same, I wish I were in sea view. We have been tremendously busy. The Committee on Human Rights sat all Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and this morning. After long debates, the Committee satisfactorily agreed to the draft which Tegan and I had prepared, but it was very tense, as a very clever Belgium socialist called Rollin, who is president of their Senate, united with Thomas to kill off the idea of a court. The level of debate was very high indeed but keeping discussions within bounds, and then yesterday putting 14 resolutions required absolute application. All the Continentals are, however, very kind and complimentary about my presiding. Darling Mo, this is the new assembly. I have marked Daddy's seat with an X. I hope you had a good journey. I had. Please give all at Sean my love. Love and kisses from Mummy. After a second bloodbath, they are on the continent of Europe looking to international organisations by which states take joint action to buttress things, which at the beginning of this century were taken for granted. The absence of arbitrary imprisonment, torture and official murder, the presence of freedom of thought, of religion, of marriage and political association. It is impossible not to look back 
without distress at the hopeful and enthusiastic beginnings of the Western Europe movement, which was so quickly to dissolve into doubt, hesitation and pain. To those of us who believed passionately in European unity, it was an enthralling period, like a dawn of a new era. It seems almost incredible, were it not true, that we should have had so contemptuously thrown over an opportunity for leading Europe into an economic, military, moral and cultural unity without parallel in her long and tortured history. Had we taken our proper part in those years, in associating ourselves warmly with the European Union, our economic and political authority in the free world would have been enormously increased. But a melancholy decision was taken, and Great Britain, the saviour of Europe in war, haughtily cut herself off in peace from the great European Renaissance, posterity rightly will deal harshly with those who quenched this flame, and who did not see, until it was too late, that idealists are often the true realists in mighty enterprises. themselves.